it's never a good idea to make generalizations or observations that apply to everyone. Because except for God, he's the only one who really applies to everyone. Because he made everyone. <laughs> generalizations are like that, though. People like to generalize. Because it's easier to blame everything in general than it is to get specific. Because after all, you can say, well, you know. And then somebody will go, yeah, I know. But someone else will go, no, I don't know. That someone else is me. <laughs> Anytime I hear generalizations, I kind of go, not. The first word in my mouth, not. Because generalizations often are what are called truisms. Now, it's funny because all these words that we're using right now, like truism and generalizations, they all make it sound like it's okay to say them. Because, you see, in advertising, you want to appeal to the broad base of people. And that's usually where most of the English grammar we use today comes from. Advertising. Somebody, somewhere, wants to sell you something. They might want to sell you their point of view, their political party, their product, their idea, even their religion. But somebody, somewhere, when they use these kinds of words, they're trying to sell you something. Jesus went a little bit opposite of our advertising-based terminology and our way of doing commercialization and you know free enterprise and democracy. He said, no. And he meant no. He said yes, and he meant yes. There was no debating it or coming back to it. Now, nowadays, people will say, well, yes, and then they'll backtrack. You know, you've seen it. You had a parent who, you know, possibly said yes to you, and then, or said no to you, and then you worked and manipulated your little, you know, kind of like batted your eyelids, you know, or you went, oh, daddy, please, you know, and kind of looked at them so sweet that, you know, they caved in because of your emotional appeal. Sometimes kids will stomp their feet, shout and scream in the middle of a store, you know, and some parents, well, you know, they'll give in. <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> but Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Pure and simple. Sadly, for my wife, <laughs> she's had to deal with me. I learned that lesson a long time ago. When I say no, I mean no. <laughs> when I say yes, I mean yes. And like everyone in all relationships, no matter who you are or where you are or how old you are or young or wherever, there's always that perspective of challenging authority, challenging what you said. Do you really mean that? Do you mean that? Are you sure? Well, be sure. You see, God doesn't want us to be uncertain about what we say. He would prefer we shut up and say nothing and be thought wise and to open our mouths and prove how stupid we are. Because God wants us to say yes when we mean yes and no when we mean no. Now, I find interesting that in generalizations and truisms, there's always people that are making broad-based statements about what they think other people ought to do or should do or want to do. You know, and it's fascinating to me because often they don't live up to what they say they want someone else to do. And that's where I always see the contradiction. You usually find contradictions in a person's own statement. You don't have to come from outside to look in, you know, to see where someone's coming from. You can look from what they're saying to what they're doing and see the contradiction. Or even worse, nowadays, you can see in their own statements what they say and then Within a few sentences, they'll usually contradict themselves. That's kind of where you know I find it interesting, you know, in my lifetime, to watch these things happen. You know, Jesus said, and that's usually what gets most people into trouble, because you see, whenever someone usually has some kind of defense mechanism, they'll avoid every other scripture in the world except for the words in red. You see, they, or I should say, they'll avoid every word in red and go to every other scripture in the world. 
Because, you see, when I confront someone or I talk to someone, you know, I find them always talking about, well, you know, in Thessalonians or in Corinthians or, you know, anywhere else except for the words in red. Except for what Jesus said. Because, you see, you can argue theology, and I'm very good at arguing theology. I know my dogma, I know my doctrine, I know my hermeneutic, my homiletic, I know all the different words and terminologies, and I know exactly what it is to come from, you know, Arminianism versus, you know, this kind of like Catholicism versus papacy versus the history versus the perspective, you know, that takes the long term versus the short term, and the cause and effect of immediate results versus long term, you know, causatory effect of the changes that happen when somebody starts something and then it's rearranged by somebody else who, you know, followed it but didn't follow it exactly, you know, they kind of make interpretation as opposed to application and how they all work it all out, you know, in some kind of theological papers that they present, you know, in kind of seminary and in theological school and Bible schools and all these kind of things in order to get them the name for themselves so that they can walk around with a reverend or a doctor or a title behind them or before them in any way that they shape for because they think that they know what they're talking about. I know what that's about. <laughs> and I have none of it. I can argue every one of them. Easy. Well, sort of. You see, I kind of learned that if I ask God, he answers. And so whenever I'm talking to someone, I, I ask God what to say, and he tells me. So I could argue theology, because, you know, I, I got a little bit of a mind, you know, kind of a little bit of an intellect, you know, some intelligence, a little bit of logic, you know, big nose, you know, that kind of helps. <laughs> My hands keep moving, you know. But, and a right attitude, because I laugh a lot, because I think it's funny when people argue theology. It's, to me, it's the dumbest subject in the world. Same thing with philosophy. To me, philosophy and theology are no difference. You know, they're just dumb you know, when they, people argue about them. But Jesus was different. He uh, kind of like hit it right, hammer on the nail. He said, I say it to you. He didn't say, you know, like, well, you know, think about it or pray about it or, you know, work it out or, you know, according to this or according to that, you know. No, he said, you read, now I said. And that's the problem. You see, people today, whether they know it or not, avoid what Jesus said. They don't want to know bluntly what Jesus said, often because it's kind of like hearing a hellfire and brimstone message. Once you've heard one, you know what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> there's no doubt about it. They used to call them the old, old 1800s, you know, when it used to be like people needed to be woke up from their complacency. They'd say that, you know, the hellfire brimstone messages were kind of like they were dangling you over a fire, you know, and you were hanging on by a string and that God was holding the scissors just waiting to cut you off. You know, that's the old description of a hellfire brimstone message. Well, you know, God's not like that, but they were using that in order to cause people to wake up, pay attention, I got a sermon. You know, and so they would go into all these theatrics, you know, kind of like some preachers do today. You know, they go, can I get an amen? Or they throw their hands in the air, or they spittle or slobber, or they carry these little napkins around, you know, because of all their spittle and slobber. You know, or they got to grab a snake or, you know, do some special third or fourth take on a movie program that they're doing, you know, or they got to have some band of choir, you know, singing, ah, man. Doing all these theatrics in order to get you to wake up. Well, you know, I mean, I'm not really against it. Of course, I'm not really for it. Matter of fact, I probably wouldn't go to it, but if it works for you, do it. <laughs> Maybe you're one of those kind of people that needs entertainment, you know? I mean, everybody's got a television set. You might as well go to church and get entertained too, I suppose. But you see, Jesus was different than that. He really didn't, you know, like when they went out in the desert to find Jesus or they went to see him, they kind of went to be entertained sometimes because they wanted to see miracles and they wanted to get healed. But even then, Jesus was kind of like one of those wrong kind of healers. Yeah, you know, not one of those faith healers that tell you to come unto me, you know, and I'll get you healed and, you know, donate the prosperity that you see, you know, so that you can pay for my ministry. You get it? You see? <laughs> well, no, Jesus was like that. You see, Jesus would, you know, kind of like heal people. You know, he did that. But then he also told them, look, you're only coming to get healed. Now I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear. Okay, time to leave. And sure enough, they did. You see, that's the problem with what Jesus said. That's the problem with the words in red. They confront you where you're at, 
who you are, where you are. Now, I was a little weird in my uh, relationship with God to begin with. <laughs> I didn't know I wasn't supposed to read the words in red. I didn't know I was supposed to like be involved in, you know, like all the other junk, you know, kind of get like theologically correct or, you know, get my doctrine down or get my dogma down or kind of like, you know, follow my uh, homiletic so that my hermeneutic was right, you know, but quite frankly, <laughs> I read the words in red, you know, and I read what they said. And I know what they say, you know, and I don't have a problem with what they mean because I read them. They say what they mean, and they mean what they say. Because, after all, Jesus said what he meant. And if he meant that it to be a parable, he said, this is a parable. And then he told his disciples, this is the meaning of it. So, we don't have a problem knowing when Jesus was serious and when he was even more serious because he was never kidding around. As a matter of fact, you'll find in all that Jesus said and did, he was direct about his approach. I find that interesting because, you see, nowadays, I'm hearing people tell me all the time, well, you know the Sermon on the Mount, you know how that love your enemies things. He didn't mean love your enemies. He meant, you know, in the sweet by and by, in the sky, someday we'll be there, and until we are, you know, guess what? You just try to love your enemies. Just try. Because you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. So just try. You know, just, you know, shoot them in the meantime, but, you know, just try. Okay. He didn't mean what he said. Great. So you're telling me that you know what he meant. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's not really what it means. Ah, I got gotcha. you. So you know what it means. Well, no, I don't really, but I'm just telling you that doesn't mean what it says because you can't live like that. God knows you wouldn't want to be one of those Christians that die like a martyr, you know, like they did in the early church. You wouldn't want to be one of those, you know, following what Jesus said, doing what Jesus did, being called one of those Christ-like people, you know, because you died like Jesus did. You don't want to be one of those, do you? I mean, no, that's, that's not what he meant. Or is it? I find when even Calvary pastors or anybody, any pastor or any man of God or any woman of God or any person, place or thing or dog or mule or cat or angel or any other thing that comes up to me in heaven and on earth, they usually have an excuse when it comes to the words in red and what Jesus said. They don't have a reason, but they got a good excuse. You know, it's like, well, you know, you know we got to compare scripture with scripture, you know, so let's just take what Jesus said, put it over here for a while, you know, we'll come back to it, and they don't. And we'll talk about what Thessalonian, you know, the Thessalonican, Paulinian kind of theological perspective is over here. You know, after all, you know, Paul was witnessing, you know, what Jesus wanted us to know, you know, you know, you know grace, 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 you know, you know, let's go this way. Okay. But I had had a problem here. I'm not one of those kind of guys, you know. I like it here from the horse's mouth, you know. I'm kind of like one of those guys that likes to check out the hooves, you know. Let me see these hooves. I want to see if this horse really has been plowing in the fields or if it's just been in the showroom too long. I want to see if this Palomino really has some muscles, you know, in its haunt, haunches, you know, or if it's just kind of like flubber and fat, you know, and it's just gotten big and round and that it's good for the fields but not to be ridden. I want to know whether or not, you know, my purebred, purebred Arabian horse, you know, really is purebred Arabian horse and has a, you know, little thing that sticks up with his tail, you know, looks like a thistle and a broom, you know, and goes flying in the wind, you know, or if it's just, you know, like somebody, you know, using a little starch, you know, and it doesn't work that way. You see, I like to see where, what, how, and why Jesus said what he said, and did he mean it? Because a lot of times people will tell me what to believe. But they won't tell me who to go to to find the truth. They'll tell me why I can't believe in what I do. But they won't tell me why I can accept what Jesus said. You see, I'm a little different. I'm a little weird. You know, I'm kind of one of those wackos, you know, kind of crazy. You know, I'm kind of silly, kind of stupid, you know. I kind of tell people, look, hey, if God tells you to do it, go do it. That's simple for me, you know. Abraham had that problem. You know, Abraham was going along, you know, just fine being a worshiper of, you know, the moon gods and goddesses and killing kids, you know, and doing all these other weird things, you know. 
Okay, maybe he wasn't happy with that, but he didn't know any better. He didn't know anything different. And then God said, and all of a sudden Abraham was changed. God spoke to Abraham and said, I, you know, I want to take you out of this. I want to show you a different way to go. I want to, I want to do something new, something different, something you don't know. Abraham was a heretic. Yep, sure was. Man, he was like, sorry, as far as the moon god was concerned, as far as the Chaldeans were concerned, Abraham was a heretic. By golly, yep, he was wrong. Had to excommunicate that, that little sucker because he said that God spoke to him. And we know that God don't speak. Our gods don't speak. I mean, why should Abraham's God speak? And yet, maybe we know the rest of the story. Maybe we know that God spoke to Abraham. I don't know about you, but you know, if I had to throw out what Jesus said and interpret it, I'd have to throw out what Abraham said and interpret it. I'd have to start making things up, you know, on, on the fly, you know, and lie about what was written for me by my own definition of what the Bible says it's supposed to be here for, my instructions and wisdom, my directions, my inspiration, my examples of faith, even the people that I'm supposed to look to, quite frankly, said, we heard what God spoke. We did what God said to do. We obeyed rather than sacrificed to God. I find that interesting. Because, you see, when I talk to Jesus, I look at what he tells me, you know, like, love your enemies and, you know, do this, or bless are you if you're poor, or whatever, you know, how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I don't see that as hard, you know, to do what Jesus said. I find it a little tougher to explain away what Jesus said and try to not do what he's told me to do when I read it. Now, I'll admit, it's pretty easy to just blitz by, you know, like you can read it, bless our poor prayer, you know, and then you pick out some card that you want to use or views, as the case may be. And a lot of people do. I find that happening all the time. And yet, when I ask someone, you know, just like the average Joe on the street, you know, I'll say, hey, what makes a Christian a Christian? Well, you know, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, and all that stuff. And the average Joe on the street knows what Jesus said. My problem today is, why don't Christians know what Jesus said? You know, Mahatma Gandhi made the same statement. He says, you know, I don't have any problem with what Jesus said. I have a problem with what Jesus' disciples said. You know, I mean, or Jesus' followers, what they do today. They don't do what he said. You know, if they did, I might accept it. But since they don't, I won't. And he didn't. He actually embarrassed, in a lot of ways, the reality of what evangelical Christians are today. Mahatma Gandhi probably was more like Jesus than a lot of evangelicals are. Not all, because that's one of those generalizations, but a lot. Because, you know, a lot of evangelicals think that they can grab their gun and shoot everyone up. You know, I mean, hey, in defense, I have the perfect right to protect myself and to make sure that I kill the other guy, that little sucker. Well, yeah, the law says you can, but what did Jesus say in the letters it read? You know, I mean, when he told him to go out and get a sword, he didn't say go out and get, you know, swords for all my disciples, you know, because he said, you know, you got two, that's fine, there's 12 of us, you know, so what are we going to need more than two swords for? Because right after he said that, guess what, you know, the disciples come, you know, the Romans come, you know, and the priest is there, and Peter pulls the sword, cuts his ear, Jesus heals it and says, you know, you don't live by the sword, you die by the sword, you know, so you don't use swords. He was using an object lesson of asking them to purchase swords at the time for the purpose of being a demonstration of fulfillment of prophecy, not to arm yourself. I've never seen so many people distort one scripture to try to get away with murder, literally. And that's what they try to do, is get away with murder. Because you see, you can tell me thou shalt not kill, and it doesn't mean that, it means thou shalt not murder, and you can tell me that it doesn't mean this, that, or the other thing. But you know, I like to put everything in perspective of eternity. Wait a minute, you want me to, you know, kill this guy off because of a political war? You want me to shoot somebody because of some, you know, politician? You want me to play Vietnam in Afghanistan now? You know, where now we're finding out Afghanistan is no different than Vietnam. It just worked out to where somebody got damned, you know, and we're going to wind up paying the price in the long term 
aspect of it. I wonder, do you really know in Iran what went on when we set up the Shah and then got thrown out and then got thrown in and then he went in and then went out and we keep trying to do these things, manipulating people? Do you know what went on in Iraq? Do you really know what people are doing when they take up their guns in their attitudes of their hearts when they say they're using it for protection? Are they really? According to what Jesus said, no. No, they're not. They're violent men with violent means seeking privily to lay traps and desires to cause others to fail and to fall that they will also fall into their own traps that they lay for others. In other words, when you seek to defend yourself, you'll lose your life. But he that loses his life for the sake of God will find it. You see, you got to trust in somebody. And if you're going to trust in your strength of arms, your arms will fail sooner or later. If you're going to trust in your gun collection, somebody's going to take that gun collection and use it on you. If you trust in any other thing except the Lord, you're going to find that it'll fail. But you see, when you trust in the Lord, here's the difference. In the long term, even if you died, you're still there with God. And you're aware that you trusted in the Lord. Because He brought you home to Him. But if you're trusting in something else, you might find yourself someplace else. I hate to say it, it can happen that way. Because Jesus said, in the same words in red, that he said, Jesus said, you call me Lord, but why don't you do the things I said? Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, have we done all these things? You know, like, hey, you know, he says, well, I don't know you. I, I, I just don't know you. You know, you tell me you know me, but I don't know you. And you know, if Jesus doesn't know us, if Jesus doesn't know me, and I, you know, he tells me that, I'm dead. It don't matter what's in red. <laughs> I'm dead, literally. In other words, I'm heading for the lake of fire. Sorry. The only way I have salvation is if God knows me and I know God. If I have the Son, I have life. If I have not the Son of God, I'm not life. Because that's what determines our life. Knowing Jesus and growing in the knowledge of Him is what eternal life is and it's all about. So I find it interesting when men of God, including people I really respect, will exaggerate, excuse, step aside, work around, try to tell you, well, you don't want to be an extremist, you know. Don't don't do what Jesus said. Interpret it. Or let me explain it to you. You don't get it. Right. I personally am one of those kind of goofy, kind of Abrahamic kind of people, you know. I kind of like God to take my name from Abraham to become Abraham because I listen to what God says. I do what God says. I like to understand what Jesus said. I like to understand and know that Jesus spoke. And he said to me, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. And they will not follow the voice of another. I like to think that I know the voice of Jesus because I'm one of those kind of guys. I've heard God speak. I've heard Jesus speak to me. about the words in red? Well, what do you mean the words in red? You know, well, you, do you have a Bible with the words in red? Well, yeah. Have you ever read them? Well, no. I said, well, start there. Well, what do you mean? Well, start there. I said, quite frankly, if you want to hear Jesus speak, don't you think you ought to know what he said before he starts talking again? You might get the wrong Jesus. <laughs> oh, but Jesus, I got the wrong one. And to be honest, nowadays, that's possible. There's some kind of you know, church out there that wants to go way out of its way to say, hey, you know what? Jesus was the brother of Satan. You know, and I'm going, maybe yours was, mine wasn't. Because <laughs> that's not what he said. Maybe you said, but that's not what he said. <laughs> Sorry, wrong person. And there's a lot of people named Jesus out there, you know, and they, they also have all these weird ideas about these different kinds of people named Jesus. But I think Jesus could speak for himself, and he did. So I'm pretty content with knowing the voice of the person that I'm following that I use my name to call myself by. Because I'm following after him. 
I'm going towards him. I'm wanting to know him. I will come under him and I will live through him and I will be with him always. So I, I kind of like to get to know someone like that. And I kind of like to pay attention to what he said. And I kind of like to know if I know what he said or if I interpret by convenience to make excuses why I'm not doing what he said. And that's the reason why people don't read the words in red. Because, bluntly, they're not doing what he said. Abraham believed in the Lord and it counted to him for righteousness. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was able to do. God promised, God did. God said, God was the one responsible for doing it. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. It was stated because of that, Abraham was righteous. Not because Abraham did the right thing, but God gave to him that title of being righteous because he said to him, you're righteous. Imputed to him. For unto us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, even God our Father. The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, believing in God. The just shall live by faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised us. I keep looking over to the right because I see my hummingbird. <laughs> he came over, you know, and he's kind of like, oh, there he is, he's humming around, you know, he's like moving around. Waiting for me to get out of the way so he can go get some sugar. <laughs> Our God is in the heavens, and he has done whatsoever it hath pleased him. With God nothing shall be impossible. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. When God speaks to you, whether it be Mary in the incarnation, or it be you in some way of revelation that God is talking to you in some way today, don't doubt it. Believe it. Accept it. Realize that God is speaking to you, and you can accept what he says over what man says every day of the week, including today. Because what Jesus said, he will do. And what he said, he meant. And that's what you can trust in. God will always say what he means and means what he says because he's communicating with you. He's not trying to deceive you. So don't be deceived. God reveals. God speaks. And God will make you aware of his voice, of his life, of his son, of his words as he reveals them to you. Not as you're being told by someone else what to believe in.